So I'd like to move straight on to the next panel, which I think follows on very nicely from Sam Parmesano's comments about the competitiveness challenges that America faces and that the whole world is dealing with. And I'd like to bring on my panelists now. Firstly, Glenn Hutchins. Uh, Glenn, um, a round of applause, please. Glenn is uh, the boss of... Um, <laughs> In fact, one of the co-founders of Silver Lake, and I, I think one of the most astute uh, investors in technology, particularly maturing technology, turned around companies like Skype and, and others, and, uh, but has also been a, a person I've enjoyed talking about the economy with over the years and has had a background in, in, in government under the Clinton administration. Um, secondly, um, Klaus Kleinfeld, who is the uh, boss of Alcoa, um, Klaus. <laughs> And previously uh, ran Siemens in, in, the, in the United States. Um, and lastly, but by no means least, uh, Michael Spence, who is a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist. <laughs> and I want to start with Michael because, I mean, Michael, you wrote this absolutely terrifying piece uh, in, in Foreign Affairs a couple of, of years ago, really setting out um, just how challenging uh, the world has become for America and indeed a number of other mature economies, given these two shifts of globalization and, and, and technological innovation that are going on. Could you just, and, and I gather you've updated that research, I just wonder if we could start by you just setting out for us what you see the, the data telling us and what the challenges are. Well, so what, what we've tried to do is look back over the last couple of decades in a, in a few advanced economies, the US, Germany, and Italy, just to kind of check. And what we're interested in is figuring out where jobs are created and where value added or growth comes from. And so a quick summary of that research, and I don't want to bore people, but I, th I think it sort of sets a context for the kinds of things we're up against is the tradable side of these economies, the goods and services that trade internationally, which is a growing set uh, because of technology and management innovation, is not a net employment generator in any of those three economies. And I suspect if we look at other, that's over 20, 20 years, mind you. Um, now, if you look inside the tradable sector, what you find is that the higher income jobs are growing and the lower income, middle income jobs are declining. And you net it out and you get zero. It's actually a little negative. And there's other interesting differences in these economies. The income distributions don't look anything like the same. On the, on the non-tradable side, what's essentially happened in these economies is that the non-tradable side, you know, the government, healthcare, retail, construction, all those things that you have to do locally, they've grown, but they've kind of used up the growth with adding people. And so the incomes haven't grown, the value added hasn't grown, it's consistent with the flat, um, the flat uh, middle class income growth that we see in a number of places. So, so People, when I say that, Matthew, people say, well, that's globalization, and I say, no. You know, this, we know this is an, it's an unknown in terms of weights, combination of labor-saving technology uh, in a variety of areas, manufacturing, management of information, and so on, on the one hand, and, uh, and, and moving jobs around the global economy. But there's a big, powerful forces. They're not crisis-related, they're, they're, they're not, and so I think, the kinds of things that Klaus will speak about in a minute, you know, are probably important parts of the solution. But the message is, uh, if you move up the skill, education, and income dimension, the global economy starts to look, and the tradable side of these economies looks pretty interesting. And if you're further down the spectrum, uh, as Mohammed said last last week, it's it, you know intergenerationally, it's looking pretty tough. So just, just to extrapolate for us, I mean, on current policy and current trends, I mean, wh what do you see the outlook for, for jobs in America being? Well, the then you have to overlay one other thing, which is the global economy, largely because of Europe and America first and then Europe, has taken a tremendous demand hit, negative demand shock. And so you, you see actually unemployment everywhere in the global economy because of, because it's such a big, a big hit and it spills over. What you are seeing in the American economy now, and my colleagues can comment in much more detail on this, is we are starting to structurally adapt. Our exports are growing faster than imports, manufacturing starting to grow. These labor markets will, will start to clear in a certain sense, but it'll be very slow and painful, absent 
you know, an improvement in the process by which people identify the skills they will need, you know, not that their parents need it, and then and companies help them talk about that. And I, and I really hope in close we'll talk about that. It's a tremendously important part of responding to this as best we can. So, Glenn, let me come to you next. I mean, I, also, I thought Klaus was next. He's just... uh, well, we'll come to Klaus. Klaus has got the answers. That's the thing. So. <laughs> I want to um, hear them. I'm anxious to hear them. I want to, first of all, do, do you share, Glenn, do you share, do you share Michael's analysis, and do you think we are seeing signs of adaptation in the U.S. to, to the crisis? Certainly, that's the case. Um, but, you know, Keynes said in the long run, we're all dead, right? <laughs> uh, and the problem is, what can we do today to kind of get it going? Um, and so my... The, the big issue right now for the creation of jobs today, we need to have a set of strategies for creation of jobs in the future, but we also need to respond to the issues today because one of the things that's going to happen pretty soon is long-term unemployment benefits are going to begin to roll off. We've had the longest long unemployment benefits ever, 99 weeks. That's about to end. No talk of extending them significantly. Um, and I think that's retarded some of the increased unemployment, perhaps marginally, but retarded some of the transition from middle to low-wage jobs that you've talked about. So I think the situation, while unemployment might go up, then the quality of employment might go down, which was signaled recently by the increase in part-time jobs, that was part of the new, uh, the, the new un unemployment numbers we saw. So there's an immediate problem today that Michael's uh, long-term adjustment mechanisms can adjust, address those sort of things that Klaus is doing um, in more of the medium term can get at. Um, but so what can we do right now, uh, and what can government do? I think that one of the most important things government can do is lift some of the uncertainty associated with its own fiscal uh, situation. Uh, and um, the, you know, because government politicians come in to say, um, how can we create jobs? And I say, you can't because you don't. Um, government does not, tip, does not create jobs. It can create the, some of the conditions under which, as a result, as a secondary or tertiary impact of what they do, companies can create new jobs. Um, but uh, one thing government can do, because it has a 100% in its power, is to put its own fiscal house in order. And I would say after, ag uh, after what economists call aggregate demand, what we business people call revenue, <laughs> as the major uncertainty um, in the world today, uh, one of the biggest things that's, I think, got markets and investors and uh, company executives who can either uh, invest in new PP&E or inquire other businesses to grow uh, stymied is that we don't have a good sense of the fiscal picture. And so I mean, what, what after exactly, the election, that is a critical thing that has to happen. I mean, what exactly is the scenario that business people are worried about on this fiscal front, though? Because, I mean, it does seem like America can probably sustain a deficit for, you know, without you know, coming to a crunch for some years. It can print, as, as Larry Summers points out, you've got the power to print your own money ultimately and you know, interest rates are very low at the moment so America could borrow a lot more and invest it in infrastructure and so forth. Why are, why are business people so worried about, about that scenario to the extent that you feel they're not creating jobs because of it? Well, we, um, the, I think there are a couple pieces to it. The first is uh, business people understand kind of uh, intuitively that you can't run an economic enterprise for a significant period of time that's not self-sustaining. Uh, and the, the, the idea that the, we can sustain ourselves by running the, running the printing press is something that people sort of, I think business people in particular them sort of scoff at because in the long run, the, work, the, 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 the exorbitant privilege associated with the reserve currency has moved from one country to another over the course of the past, and it will do that again if we, uh, if we uh, don't uh, husband and protect that privilege as opposed to uh, abuse it. Um, and so uh, that's kind of, I think, big point number one is we think the, there's a general view that the United States as an economic enterprise should be sustainable. Uh, and, if you, and by being sustainable in the past, the United States has had been able to create the conditions under which American business and the American influence in the world was, was, uh, was unrivaled by anyone. Um, so I think that's kind of uh, number one. Uh, and number two, there's a fear that what we saw in the summer of 2011 was a precursor or microcosm of what could come in the markets if we fail to get our house in order. Uh, because um, we all know that markets do two things. One is they rise slowly but go down suddenly. Um, and they don't wait for the event to happen to price it in. Uh, and a, uh, an, a, an action that does not inspire confidence in actions that, like in the summer of 2011, actually uh, uh, cause people to have a concern about the f fiscal management of the American economy could have meaningful impact on the markets. 
I think you put those two things together and you see why the business community is, is um, quite uh, ac uh, acutely interested in that. Today, uh, you might have seen there's a, a, a group kicked off, a group called Fix the Debt kicked off a big campaign. Uh, we've got, um, um, I think it's 80 some CEOs from different parts of the world. Klaus signed up, I signed up. Uh, and uh, we are trying to create the conditions under which uh, the politicians can, can cut a deal. And the thing that's incredible is a lot of people saw this uh, ABC, I think NBC, pardon me, Wall Street Journal poll that said the electoral race was, 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 um, was locked at, at Mitt Romney's 47% each. Um, thought that was kind of an uh, amusing number to have. But the, uh, and one of the things that's said in there is that 75% of the people polled, regardless of party, felt that their party should compromise on their respective issue, income, you know, revenue or spending in order to get a deal done. Only 15% thought they think they should hold the line ideologically. So this is an issue of widespread consensus in the United States. And you think it's possible to fix this medium term situation without going down the route of austerity policies like you Well, you have, well there'll be some Europe. degree of, I mean, we won't have austerity like we have in the UK, but we're talking about a, a, the, the idea is to get a $4 trillion deal my, you know, give or take uh, 100 billion here or there, right? Um, and uh, that's supposed to, and the, but the concept is that you arrest the growth of debt as a percent of GDP, because there's a lot of research, which Michael understands much better than I do, that shows when you get to certain threshold levels of debt as a percent of GDP, you have persistent declines in, in national growth rates. And so if you create the conditions under which you can arrest the, the debt as, as a percent of GDP over a long-term time period, and those are real and binding and reliable, and the markets can forget about what's going on in Washington, go back to work again. Then you create the conditions under which business people can take the short-term steps and the, me the medium-term steps to facilitate this long-term adjustment that Michael's suggesting we need to do. So Klaus, let's just stick with that macro story briefly. I mean, you signed this pact along with, with Glenn. Um, I mean, is, is, the, is the message of that that if the fiscal situation is put on a more sustainable footing, business will start to unleash that cash from, from the will, balance sheet I, I, and that there will I, I, be job I will, creation. I will start from the other end. What's happening today, and uh, uh, Glenn uh, referred to it, I think all of us may even by the day remember where we were <laughs> when the US was downgraded last year and what then happened in the, mar in, in the market, right? Mm. That, that very fact tells you how impactful this, this was. And I think confidence is a very, very weak uh, plant you can destroy it very easily, and it's already... But a lot of people would say that downgrade was a, a political move as much as anything else. Well, whatever it was, it destroyed a lot of confidence. And, that, and, and, and the funny thing is that confidence decides where you put your money in the boardroom. You know, what happens in all boardrooms around the world? If you go forward with, let's say, I, I come to my board and say, I want to invest 100 million here. You know, what's my board going to ask me? Klaus, are you sure you want to do it today? We have another board meeting in three months from now. Do you think we should wait? Don't you think we should wait? And that's happening in every boardroom around the world. Well, that's the reality. And if people are saying, hey, the companies are sitting on massive amounts of cash, guess what? Because we've all seen what happened, how quickly it happened, end of 2008, early 2009, right? And because we might be worried about where it's going, right? Once this changes, you will see a tremendous change in the economic activity because the fundamentals and I, I heard a little bit of what Sam talked about, and I full-heartedly agree. The fundamentals of what we have around this world are extremely positive. I always talk about, yesterday I was over in North Carolina, I talked to students, you know, and, and the message from my end was, don't forget the large picture. The large picture is we, we, we have the potential to have an unbelievably exciting time that we are going to, because the technological advances that we are currently going through have never been as strong as today, right? What we make out of it is in our hands, and short term, I'm deeply concerned that we're getting, as Glenn said, into a situation if the political sides are not working here. Um, and that at a time when uh, a, a, an intelligent person looks at how the solution, a, a relatively decently economically educated intelligent person looks at what uh, options do you have? They'd all come out with something that's in the four trillion range. And do you They'd all come out with, say, it has to have a component on cost cutting, but it also has to have revenue component. Otherwise, it won't solve. And do you think the the the, 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 the typical board meeting in America at the moment, there's a serious concern that the fiscal cliff. We will go over the fiscal cliff here. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, talking to any one of my colleagues here, and by the way, I would not restrict that to the US. 
I think we're talking about, a f given how globally interactive the world is today, I think that's the phenomenon that happens in pretty much every firm that has a global perspective. So I'm very, to, to give an optimistic to view that, I'm very optimistic that our, uh, the political class understands this problem, sees it in a very similar way in terms of the problem, and is prepared to reach sort of compromises. And I would encourage them to do that, and I think that, that was all message. That was all message. So you, so you think we'll avoid the fiscal the, No, problem. I didn't say, but there are a group of people who know more. I am not, as a friend of mine often says, I'm not licensed to practice politics. This is not something I know anything you about. You did that one day. No, poli yeah, policy, not <laughs> politics. Um, but there is some group of people who think we need to have a catastrophe like 2008 that forces people to act, forces people to compromise and act. What I say to that is, we already had that catastrophe. We don't need to do it again. I would agree. Let's learn from that and avoid it rather than go through it again. But there is some group of people who study this, who've had the experience, are closer to Washington, closer to politics. That's the only way we get them to act. This is why I think this effort on the part of the uh, business community to create uh, the conditions under which people can meet and have some degree of encouragement and or cover, however you look at it, from the business community saying we really need this had to happen, is a constructive thing that I think and hope and expect uh, so our, I just wanted just one more point on one more point on this. That I mean, when I talk to business people, there's, you know, they usually give you a, a long litany of things that are wrong at the moment that are, are causing them to be uncertain about the future. And it's, you know, it will start with the fiscal position, but it will then go about uh, regulation, the regulatory environment. Uh, it'll be trade. You know, is, is this going to be a trade war or whatever, and so forth. It, it's so so. Um, you know, the, the, the enforcement thing, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Is it, you get this long, long list. Now, is, is, can you assure us that you know, if, if, if this one issue is dealt with, is the issue, you know, the tax reform, you know, reforming the tax system to, to make it uh, more competitive, I mean, is the, is the deficit the key issue that's going to start releasing the money? If you actually solve the deficit problem, are the others sort of important but not fundamental to this? Getting back on in track. crisis time, it's a question of what basically is the drop that, uh, the last drop in the bucket that makes it overflow, right? That's the question that's, that, that's here, right? And I believe, I mean, if, it, if we let it come to a situation where uh, in the eyes of the rating agencies, whatever is done in the lame duck session is not sufficient to satisfy their views, and they come to even publicly speculate about another downgrade, I, I, I would give you one assurance that, that that would have an impact, and I would be totally with Glenn that that's not priced in at these days. I mean, I think the market is as confident as I am, right, that there will be a, a good act, and people will act smartly, and I think if, it, if there's one sense that uh, this 80 business folks that got together and said, well, we want to send that message clearly to Washington, because the good news is... That, that, that there has to be something in the lame duck session. I think that's, that's, that's the... Uh, at the latest point in time, that's the moment in time when we, ha we have to see that things are coming together, right? And frankly, I mean, there is, the, the foundation is there. I mean, the president has uh, basically put a, a group, Simpson and Bolts, together, with was, which, which was bipartisan, which had very, very good uh, business people in there that have our trust. So there is some type of foundation there which, which one can start on. You don't have to start from scratch. So, so I want to hear from Michael. I want to jump in because I want to, he's the smart one on this panel, by the yeah, way. Yes, so I was going to say. Our Nobel Prize laureate. <laughs> yeah, we want to make sure. He, but let me, let me just emphasize, reemphasize what I said really quickly, which is that I think the biggest uncertainty is demand for our products and services. That's not going to go away no matter what happens. That's going to be something we're going to struggle with in a low growth world with austerity in Europe and um, lo low but positive growth in the United States. So I think take that, take, that's always going to be there and something we have to deal with. This fiscal thing is important because it's the next level of uncertainty and because it's something government can solve and do relatively quickly, though it's big and complicated and will take time to put into place. So yeah, if you think about a problem, you can grab that, you can solve, it's there to be solved. Uh, the, the demand thing is a harder thing to solve. And then the third piece will be is the uncertainty associated with regulatory policy and other actions, other potential government actions. And I think that there's a, a real opportunity in um, post the election for whoever's president to sit down with the business community and work through those issues to get those done. Those will take a little bit more time because there you got to take them piece by piece. But I think there'll be the conditions to do that too. So Michael, well, yeah, let, let's just quickly talk about the, the overall macro demand uh, story. You know, I mean that, the Larry Summers solution is borrow a lot of money, uh, build a lot of infrastructure. You know, Krugman looks at Europe, says austerity has been a disaster. They've got to start fiscal stimulus and so forth. I mean, how do you, as an econ a Nobel Prize winning economist, view that that question and how much 
you know, demand policies can actually address this jobs crisis? So I see it in structural terms. I mean, you take a tremendous demand hit that comes from a, a growth, a defective growth model, which had excess combinations of private and government consumption, basically with the mix, depending on where you are, you take a hit. Because your argument was really that we, in America in particular, we were postponing the day of reckoning by gearing up the housing market and so forth. And well, yeah, and showed up in leverage. I mean, yeah. it's just simply an unsustainable, to use Glenn's term, an unsustainable growth model. Then I think we made a second error, which is we went into the leveraging, so this dropped a lot and affected the whole global economy. But what we have to realize is we're not going to go back up there, right? Was it to go back up there, you have to re restart the leverage engine, and I don't think we're going to do it. So, so, so when you look at this broadly, you basically have to finish the leveraging, deleveraging process so that you're in the safe zone. I'll come back to the fiscal side. Um, and, and, then, and then the economies have to restructure underneath it, you know, to be consistent with the demand they actually, actually have, you know, foreign and domestic. And, and, and both of those things take time, the day leveraging and whatnot. So even if you take away the drag from the, the fear of the downside risks that we've been talking about, you're still left with you know, the, the unfolding process that isn't you know, an implosion in Europe, some really dumb thing happens in Washington in January or something like that. Now, on the fiscal side, the big argument in, among economists is, you know, where is the tipping point? The answer, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so how much in, in, I mean, forgive me for being slightly nerdy, but two-thirds of the American economy is non-tradable. When you take that demand away, there isn't anything to replace it. You can't replace it with the global economy in the short run. First of all, it's only a third of the economy, and second, it's a different kind of demand. So what's, what's left is government. And what we, uh, my profession argument argues about with Krugman on one end and people who say the roof's going to fall in tomorrow on the other is, is how much of a bridge can the government provide while the economy sort of finishes the deleveraging and restructures. My view is that one wants to be cautious and, and, and we could get very near a danger zone, so I completely agree with Klaus and, and Glenn on this. And, but the implication of that is that, you know, unless you can bring this big batch of unemployed labor together with this big batch of uninvested cash, mm -hmm. you know, by raising confidence, and that is a real opportunity, then the, the rest of the story is you, you're going to have to let the patient cure sort of slowly over time. I but, think that's where we are. But there's some, Larry, Larry Summers, who I have a lot of respect for, um, has got his finger on something important, I believe. So I wouldn't, re I wouldn't personally reject his prescription out of hand. I think about it a little bit differently, which is that if we get a deal done, let's say it's a $4 trillion deal, there's still gonna be a lot of spending done by the US government. Uh, and we then have to make choices based upon our values and our objectives of kind of what we're gonna spend that money on. Hmm. As an investor, I believe it should, if we're gonna to try to create long-term benefits from it, it should look more like investments than like spending. And I think a very important investment we should make is in our infrastructure Agreed. for two reasons. One is a short-term reason is it does create jobs in the people who do those projects. And I think that'd be a positive thing. But, it, but it's, those jobs are created in a positive way because once those infrastructure projects are created, they bring long-term benefits, economic benefits to our society like any good investment does. And what are you willing to cut to, to, to let that money go into the infrastructure phase? Nice try. I'm not going to get into that. No, no, but... Uh, me, <laughs> you are a politician. Matthew, <laughs> no. Matthew, let me I mean, try. there's a lot of different choices. No, but there's two options, right? Okay, so, you, you know, households have taken this hit on the balance sheet. It's true they were overspending before. And so now they're sort of struggling along reconstructing those things. And then you come along and you say, if you really want to accelerate growth, then you, it, and it's absolutely right. You want these parallel government, you know, effective investments in education, skill, right. infrastructure, exactly. and so on. And there's two ways to pay for that. Right? The way the developing country pays for it is by reducing their current consumption, mm -hmm. which in our context means taxes. I mean, it's extraordinary what you see in developing countries. The rates of investment are 35, 40% of GDP. The question really is, you know, are we going to be able to do that? And the answer is probably you can't survive politically doing that. And so then, then you get, that's how you get to the question you asked, right. which is what are you going to cut to do it because nobody's really seriously talking about 
you know... And if we were looking to cut in a way that, min that, that had the least bad effect on jobs, I mean, what would be the areas of government spending which you think are, have the lowest job multiplier in a way? You mean net of the job creation that yeah. goes in the infrastructure Yeah, because I guess we want, we want to move money into stuff that has lots of jobs associated with it and presumably take it out of areas that don't create many jobs. Well, Do we have a sense of where the government spending yeah. uh, well, has got You have to divide the government up into kind of three buckets, uh, discretionary spending, defense spending, yeah. and entitlement spending. Yeah. And the entitlement piece is by far the biggest, and that's got to um, be reformed. There's no doubt about it. One of the good news is President Obama, who I support, um, has put in major entitlements, cuts, and reforms on the table at least twice, if you believe the books that you read, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, but I mean, the entitlement there, spending at least does go straight out into the shops and, and so yeah, forth, whereas some I'm of the just, capital gains tax but money if you, goes. But if you look at the big problem, that's where the big numbers are. Right. And so what we're really talking about is how you allocate the remainder as as between defense and discretionary spending and within discretionary spending what you allocate your resources to. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually, in that sense, not that hard a problem to solve. The big, part, the big hard spending problem to solve is on the entitlement reform piece. So, so, the money is. so let's flip the discussion a bit. And I want to come to, to the article you wrote uh, recently, Klaus, which really looks at a question that um, I, I wrote a special report last year for The Economist on, on, on jobs, and, and the title was The Great Mismatch, and it was this sense that somehow the skill set that people have and the, the jobs that exist you know, just aren't very closely correlated. And, and you have come up with a number of ideas about how business can play a more constructive role in uh, addressing that mismatch. I mean, can you just briefly talk about what, yeah, what your ideas maybe are? Maybe can I throw in, and that links these two debates, one word that has been missing in the first uh, 15 minutes here, which I think has to be the overarching theme, is competitiveness, right? So, because if we don't do anything that in the end leads to a higher competitiveness, <laughs> this is, I mean, wasting money. Mm. Wasting money, and that's my frustration about many of those debates. And, and if, we, if we believe, and I brought some, some numbers with me, because starting with competitiveness, what Economic Forum does this uh, competitiveness report every, every year? And I don't know whether you're aware of it, the US has now dropped to this, in this third straight year, it's number five in the world, right? Uh, behind Switzerland, Singapore, Sweden, and Finland. Right, so there's obviously something on the, on the factual side, you know, the mismatch just for, for all of us to have the same facts. U.S. unemployment 7.8%, so that equals 12.1 million people. Job openings at the same time, 3.6 million people, right? That's odd, right? You'd say that's strange. Skills, an interesting statistic that most people don't think of because they only look at what is the actual situation, but we're dealing with another phenomenon in the Western world called aging. An aging population, at the same time we have retirement ages that are not yet that reformed, a little bit reformed. So what we're seeing, and that's a phenomenon in most of the companies, 2.7 million manufacturing jobs will retire in the time frame, basically this is, this is numbers from 2008 to 2018, the 10-year time frame, which is good news and bad news, right? The good news is there's a lot of openings that are coming up in companies that need to be refilled. That's a great news in my view for, for, the, for the coming. And a lot of those are sort of classic science, technology, maths, it's a, engineering. It's across the board. Yeah. It's across the board of everything, right? The bad news is that a lot of knowledge is going to leave. I mean, implicit knowledge is going to leave. And if we're not careful, and if, if we don't have a, a good educational system to, that prepares the people that are coming in, we're going to be having a pretty bad, a bad awakening. You know? On the manufacturing job side, to be more specific, because in a way, manufacturing has come totally out of fashion, at least in some places. I mean, UK is probably the one that, that had gone in the Western world very, very far. But uh, in the US, it wasn't cool at all for many, many years to think about manufacturing. Manufacturing today, here in the US, has about 255,000 job openings, right? So and that's, this is from August, the last statistic that came out, right? But the interesting thing is 40% of those jobs require some type of post-secondary education, right? So, so and, and then the question is, how do you get there? And then what's our answer to it? And that's where, where, where the question comes in of vocational training. I mean, we today, uh, and on the vocational training, to give you some numbers, uh, the amount of money we've spent in vocational training has gone down. I mean, federal spending is 18% less than it was in 2006. 
right? At a time when you would think in terms of competitiveness in a faster moving environment, that's exactly what you have to invest in because that is going to determine your future competitiveness, but it's gone down, right? And you feel it's pretty clear what vocational training should be offered that would lead directly on to jobs? We know which jobs are open. I mean, if and, and I mean, I need welders. I need machine operators. I need uh, I need um, industrial machinists. You know, I can give you a whole list, and every one of my colleagues can do the same thing. These jobs are there. Uh, we we also know what we need next, and we have those 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 programs. I, and I'd be happy to talk about that. So so those are those those are those 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 are some of the numbers, and I can I can go for more. One last thing on this training thing is, if I look today at the discussion here, I find it very interesting there because here the discussion is all about you know K to 12 and then college. How do we improve that the, the basic education? We consider K to 12 plus college the basic education. I don't think that that should be considered the basic basic education. We've got to be much more flexible on this. I mean, because I always use this example of when you want to teach a 15-year-old boy, you know, to learn math, you know, and say, you got to have your K to 12 and stick in, hang in, you know, this, this guy is 15 years old. We all were once 15 years old. What's going through our mind, you know? The last thing that goes through our mind, you know, if we're not Bill Gates, is learning math, right? <laughs> but, 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 but if you, if you, say to him, you know, hey, I saw you got a Mustang, an old Mustang, and you know what, you can tune the motor to really sound cool, you know, but what you need today is you need to program the, the electronics that, that you have in front of the motor, and I'll show you how to do this. But to do this, you need a little bit of understanding of math. I tell you what, this kid is going to learn math like nobody, right? So, so and, and the reason why I'm saying that, because there are vocational training um, ideas around that are actually implemented in, in some places and in countries, and we had been here too before, where you can, with a little more flexibility, you can, should, should, we should offer these people opportunities where they can go out, where at grade nine, and then into a more vocational training oriented, where it's much more applied. I think this would immediately shoot up the rate of, of people graduating and would also give us a lot of, of additional opportunities to bring people into a job that pays. So just, to, just tell us briefly what the programs are that you've been doing there. We've, uh, we, we, we have a lot of, lot of stuff going on. Most, most of the programs that we have, all of the programs that we have here in the US are next to plans, right? And because the problem is always a local problem, you have to address it from a local perspective. To your point, you know, what needs do we have? Can I credibly claim that if you do this, you're gonna have a higher chance of getting a job or getting a promotion inside of our company? So what we have done is, we have looked around, what is the education infrastructure, the regional education, and you know what there is? There's community colleges. Community colleges, interestingly, when we started to reach out to them, which is probably three, four years ago, right? They were extremely open, extremely happy that we came because they, what they were looking for is they were looking for a curriculum that is meaningful, you know, that gives a job opportunity. And they didn't have that. So we developed the curriculum together with them, basically told them you're going to get Alcoans that want to continue their education, plus you can open it up because we know that there are jobs around and we have multiple of those around here in the U.S. Great. Well, I'm going to, in a moment, turn over to the audience and get a couple of questions. But as Michael just quickly wanted to ask you, I mean, if you had to come up with a, a strategy for shifting the education system so it's actually producing uh, the right skill sets and so forth to be competitive, I mean, what, what, is, are there a couple of changes that would lead to mind for you that, that um, would be priorities? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a mystery. I mean, the hard part is that some failures of education are actually problems in the community, in the families, and so on. And mm. that's really hard to get a hold of. But, but you would um, insist on high qualifications for teachers. You'd insist on a merit-based system. You have to marginalize or get the unions to change. I mean, these are not easy problems to tackle, but you, but you, you, you have to do that. And then, and then over time, you, you, in addition to what Klaus just said, which I think is quite imaginative, you know, how do you motivate young people so they're actually interested? But, but at some point, you know, being a teacher of young people has to be a very high status job in our totally society. Totally agree. And it's gone the other way. I agree with that. Yeah. Great. Well, let's have some uh, comments and questions. The gentleman at the front here, I'm going to take two or three at a, a time. If you say who you are, please.
No, absolutely. Mm. Right. But but I give you two statistics. Klaus is, by the way, my favorite immigrant. <laughs> <laughs> so we got another question. But, but, but can I can I give Baal two statistics <laughs> sure. that show that 13 of the t 20 top uni universities in the world are in the U.S. We are, we ne always forget that when we talk about. The other thing is 24.3 percent of all engineering startups have at least one immigrant founder here in the U.S. Right? That exactly backs your point. You know. Okay, so we've got a question at the back, and we'll, come, we'll discuss that in more detail in a moment. Question at the back, and then someone down here in the middle. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Right. Workers or, okay, you know, so the question's about, about China and is it is mercantilist policies, are they undermining jobs in America? And then we have a question down the front yeah. here. It sounds like it's a shorter term investment yes. with quicker returns. If you could talk a little bit about how much time, is this a six month thing or you could reinvest and in two years you get something back? I'd love to hear about that. So, Mike, let's first of all, I mean, deal quickly with China for us. I mean, is, is that is that is China's mercantilist strategy stealing lots of jobs from America? No, fundamentally not. I mean, you can't resist these powerful forces. I mean, you know, economic activity goes where it makes sense in the world, and the multinational companies know how to do this. And and just trying to buck that trend. You know, it seems to me to make no sense economically or in terms of welfare or anything else. And, and quite frankly, without being long-winded, I hope. You know, if China goes through the middle income transition successfully, they'll export 100 million jobs that we don't have now and we're not going to have them because they're going to be in Bangladesh and Vietnam and parts of Africa and so on. So, so no. I mean, you know, middle class jobs have gone out into the global economy. I don't, there's, it's hard to resist that conclusion, but it's not their policies. It's the, it's the natural dynamics of a global economy in which, you know, about five billion people are joining the one billion in the advanced countries and joining the party. I think your argument you make in your foreign uh, affairs article was that essentially overall America is better off by Absolutely. enough to compensate the losers if it had the right fiscal and distributional policies in, in place. I think that's clear. So the, the, the other question on immigration, there are, we've heard about two sorts of immigration policy during the last day or so, and one is you know, the, 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 the stapling a green card to every university degree approach to immigration. The other, I guess, is the much broader uh, having a much more open immigration policy that America used to have. Are both those policies positive for U.S. job creation, or is it just the first of those? You know, I wouldn't put it quite that way, um, Matthew. I think what you need in government, including immigration policy, is a, an immigration policy that is sensible and related to the capacity of the country to absorb. And that, you know, and that doesn't mean people are all the same, right? We can absorb high talent people, we can absorb people who are refugees from somewhere in some numbers, but what we need to do is sit down and think carefully you know, about what our absorptive capacity is given that we're structurally transforming and other things in the way we talked about, and then set an immigration policy that looks like that. And it's not, I mean, a number of countries have done this. You may not like all the features, but Canada has a reasonably sophisticated set of immigration policies that are kind of matched to the absorptive capacity of the economy. Glenn, do you share that view? Um, I, I think that you have to think about these solutions in short, medium, and long-term kind of pieces to it. And 
The, uh, but I take a step back, which is once you get, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be a one-no Johnny here, but once you get the, the fiscal deal done, you get that off the table, and then I talked about to deal with the other things. The other things you uh, were, which we talked about were levels of uncertainty are also basically what we're talking about here, which is the things you can do to increase the long-term competitiveness of the economy. And they are around tax reform, immigration, infrastructure investment, and education, and one or two others I'm forgetting right now. And, and so then once you get the, the big picture in place, and you've got to go to work on these, on these micro pieces, uh, microeconomic pieces. And in each of those, there's a short-term, medium, and long-term strategy as you deal with these, these, these adjustments. So I think the, uh, Klaus, in, in terms of education, I personally think the, the Obama administration's done a very good job of the race to the, race to the top uh, education reform pieces. But they need, those are longer-term solutions. And we need things like what Klaus is doing at the ground level <coughs> to kind of create opportunities today. Um, I heard someone on the immigration piece, someone said to me recently that, um, I, by the way, uh, said that rather than us competing with 300 million people against a billion people, if you think of a billion, two people, if you think about U.S. versus China, how about thinking about the United States and having five to seven billion people we can deploy and we can pick from the very best to have them here. Yeah. Uh, and we recruit from the world to come here to compete. And if we had a, an open... Uh, 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 immigration policy, I think that would be one of the most important things. But, but there are others, which I've really emphasized, tax simplification uh, being one of them, that we can do to create the conditions for real efficiencies in this country that once we're past the structural problems that Michael's talked about, we can create the conditions for real robust growth. So it's you know, getting the fiscal deal done today and then getting <coughs> strategies for national competitiveness in place that have the benefit of alleviating uh, other kind of areas of uncertainty that we talked about later, earlier and, uh, and then having people like Klaus in the marketplace today <coughs> solutions in place that are very tuned to local, local economies. Put all that together and you got the conditions for you know, an American renaissance. Great. And last, sorry, I've lost my voice in all this. Um, <laughs> Klaus, to, to finish with, um, what can we do to accelerate uh, the speed of return from investing in education? The speed of return is exactly as the question had, had referred to, is a very, very short-term one. Most of those programs actually have the uh, opportunity for the individual to, to combine it with work. So it's, it's an evening program plus weekend programs, and sometimes they have, you have blocks you know, of, of, let's say, five days or so in between. And that's, I think, the right profile. So therefore, most of those programs take two years, right? And, and they have intermediate steps, you know. You can accelerate that. I mean, but there's a lot of flexibility. I believe the idea of having an opportunity for people to stay in their job, you know, and make some money in whatever way they are in and do this at, at the same time. Typically, we in our company encourage people to do that and, and, uh, and people see that because we, we prefer to promote from inside, you know, so you see also on the shop floor there's a movement going on because suddenly people are seeing in those places, wow, I mean this person did have a very basic education and uh, he, he or she went for the last two years to this program and in the next promotion suddenly it's moved from there to the other side and it's now working on digital equipment, you know, digital x-ray, taking care of this, so it's kind of self, self starting and the investment is honestly minimal, minimal. Going back to your point, it all starts with having then a great teacher, but the combination of what the teacher teaches with the understanding that business has about what's globally competitive right. is fundam a fundamental value add. And I've seen over in Europe that there's also a role for the unions there to give kind of guidance of where is the future competitiveness. Because one thing I think that is sure, I mean, the, the, the future world is going to have very little in common with the world that we think of today. Well, on that note, um, this will teach me for ignoring the clock at the front here, that they've given me a <laughs> frog in my throat to get me to shut up. I'd like to thank the panel for a very stimulating conversation and uh, to, for, for giving us lots of positive ideas about how we can actually start to, 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 to deal with this huge and important job crisis that we face. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs>